welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. Hello, Robert, and it's great to have you on the podcast show. Welcome uh, to, to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, before I go into the meat of our conversation, I do always like to ask my guests something about their origin stories. So tell me, wh where did you go to university? What did you study? Was it inevitable you'd end up in finance? Sure, yeah. And uh, I, I feel lucky that um, I was able to start at university, have kind of have it anchored in emerging markets, if you will, and still be doing it 35, 40 years later. Um, so I'm from California. I went to uh, university at uh, the University of California in San Diego. Um, interestingly, I, I went there for two reasons. One, um, to study business, but also it had a great beach right in front of the, the, the dorms. And so I always knew I wanted to be in business, but I didn't know what, really what that meant at 18. They had something called management science there. And uh, it turned out to be not business, but some form of economics, which was um, not that exciting to me uh, at, at the time. So. I started taking courses in political science and history of Latin America uh, and a minor in economics. And, and I did that because my family is originally from, from Guatemala. And I just wanted to understand a little bit about, you know, where my family was from. And from there, I just really loved both sides, the history, the politics, and just kind of, uh, kind of kept going with that. Mm, that's great. And then what was your first job out of, out of school? <clears throat> so my first job was, was, was interesting because as I got to the end of my um, studies at, at UC San Diego, um, I my parents told me you know I had to get a job, and I had also been invited to do an honors thesis. So, um, being the lazy individual that I am, I tried to kind of put those two things together and I said, okay, well, you know, what what are the jobs in Latin America today? What's the you know what's it all about? And you know, unfortunately, you know, the biggest issue in Latin America in 1986 when I did my thesis was. The, the Latin American debt crisis. So um, I did my study, uh, my thesis on the historical origins and implications of the Latin American debt crisis. And along the way, I met a gentleman who had been the uh, finance minister of Peru. So I did a case study on Peru. And ultimately, I was able to lever that into my first job working with this small boutique in California, dealing with the resolution of the Latin American debt crisis. Okay, so you did uh, so. Okay, so you did Latin American at, at uh, history at university. Then you jumped straight into analyzing the debt crisis in in the region at the time as well. And and what what was it about? Presumably that was the start of your financial career then. And so, what, I mean, what was it about the financial industry that that made you want to stay in it? And you've been in it for so you know ever since then. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And 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 to be honest, you know, I I didn't come at it from finance per se. I came at it from Latin America first. And quite frankly, in that first job, which I did for about three and a half years, you know, I realized there was a lot of financial aspect to dealing with finance in Latin America. And that's why I actually decided to, to go away from liberal arts and towards a master's in finance at, at the Wharton School after my first four years. Um, and that's when I realized, you know, I really want to be Latin America. I really want to be emerging markets and I really want to do finance. But um, I had no formal training in finance. So that's, you know, kind of why I went back to school in the early 90s. Okay, great. Good, good. And then in terms of uh, asset management, where did you get your, your sort of formative experience? Sure. Um, so after I'd worked for this gentleman for four years and had done graduate school, um, I did something I didn't think I was going to do, which was I, I went and worked on Wall Street for, for, for a couple of years. Um, and I ultimately thought, you know, I'll just stay in New York and the East Coast for, for a couple of years. And then I'll, I'll go back to California and start a, a boutique. I wouldn't have called it a boutique asset management firm, but a boutique dealing with Latin American finance, whatever that 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 might mean. Um, and at Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers, I kind of ran their sovereign debt restructuring businesses um, and deployed bank capital, but also you know went alongside our clients. And I started realizing that um, you know it's difficult to advocate for capital and for clients at a bank because there's so many different conflicts of interest, you know, investment banking and research and and what have you and and that's ultimately when I decided to start Gramercy was back in 1998 when, um, you know, I remember sitting with the Russian Federation when they were an obligor to the bank. And, um, and this was actually in, in like 95, 96 when I was in Merrill. And, you know, I was just concerned about getting the capital of the bank back and of our clients. And, you know, I had someone from investment banking next to me and, and they were actually literally calling the Russians the client. I don't know, no, they're the obligor. And then that's when I realized there's such 
you know, there's so many conflicts to, to manage in an institution. And I started Grammar with me because I just wanted to be myopically focused on one thing, which was, you know, getting returns for our clients without having any institutional constraints to doing so. And then you said you started Gramercy where you're still at Gramercy today to this day in 1998. Now, obviously, 1998 is quite a famous year. We had the LTCM crisis, the Russia deval. Um, what yeah was was why did you start in 98? <laughs> so it's interesting. So um, I I decided to leave Lehman in about February or March of 1998, um, and had been offered or promised seed capital from a client of mine that ironically uh, was highly invested in Russia. And they said, hey, Robert, we, we're looking to diversify from Russia. So, you know, if you leave, we'll, we'll seed you. We think it's interesting the way you're approaching the market. Um, well, so I left Lehman like in April or May. And, you know, I, I waited around for the check. By June, they said the check's not coming, which seemed catastrophic at the time, right? I just quit my job. I'm building a house. I just had my second kid. But actually, it was really fortunate because had we launched in June or July, we would have been suffering from perhaps the, the uh, you know, what, what you mentioned, long-term and, and Russia and what have you. So the frustrating part was it, it took until April 99 to raise capital to start the firm. The good news was we, we got to buy things on the other side of both those crises um, and, you know, turned out to be quite fortunate. Yeah, that's great. And then we had a few more EM crises around that time. There was uh, Brazil, I guess, Turkey and Argentina, I suppose, in the, in the early uh, 2000s. So you, you had other uh, minefields to navigate as well. Yeah, and, 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 and quite frankly, you know, when we started managing capital in 99, we looked around and we said, okay, well, there's this index that JP Morgan has created. Um, but we felt that it, it, quite frankly, created too much legitimacy to an asset class that was still fledgling. And we felt, to your point, all these crises going on, it felt like the patient going in and out of the emergency room and not a place where you should be thinking about, you know, a strategic allocation to, to emerging market debt. So our first decade, we basically chased this flu that, that went around the world, starting with the tequila crisis, the Asian debt crisis, uh, I guess it was the Caparina crisis in Brazil, the, the vodka crisis in Russia, and ultimately the tango crisis in, in Argentina. So... We used our, our capital and our skill set, and we were very much a hedge fund back then, an emerging market hedge fund. And we did that until the global financial crisis when I would argue that, that distress was no longer idiosyncratic, but it had become systemic. And then we stepped back and we said, well, one, emerging markets have evolved quite a bit. We're distressed. Do we just do distress globally around the world? Do we do NPLs in Portugal? I'm like, no, that's, we are emerging markets. And that's when we hit the tagline, we are EM. And since then, we have really been on a path of transforming from an emerging market hedge fund to a investment management firm dedicated to emerging markets. And you know, with a lot more people, return streams, and basically having all the tools in the toolbox that we and our clients really need to be able to manage emerging markets intelligently. Now, many investors still have this association to EM of crises, you know, often from the 90s um, and the early 2000s. That's their sort of association that they have. Whereas the way you're describing it about evolution, you've actually changed, you reframed how you should look at the EM, where it's much more mature, there's more diversification across EM. So it's not the old EM that people may have in their memories. Um, so what, what, what would you say are some of the big misconceptions about EM today that you think are not uh, relevant or not appropriate? Yeah, and, um, and look, these, these crises continue. I mean, there's, in the 25 years that we've been at Gramercy, there's been 11 dislocations, starting from you know, Mexico all the way to, uh, I guess, Russia, Ukraine last year. So I, I wouldn't argue that, that, that it's matured to the point where those dislocations won't occur. Um, what I think has for us has matured is the approach and, you know, that gets into the misconceptions, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's funny when, when we look at some allocators, they, they make this assumption that, that the safest way to go into emerging markets debt is to just buy the liquid emerging market debt, right? Um, Hey, we can change our mind in three days and we can get all our capital back and, and it's liquid. And the challenge I have with that is one, most of these investors are going to have a long-term uh, allocation to emerging markets. So then one has to think about, well, what's the opportunity cost of parking in liquidity? And, you know, in a place like Mexico, you know, Pemex, maybe you get 5% for a bond, but, you know, if you go slightly less liquid, you can get kind of mid-teens to 
to lend to Pemex suppliers and, and get better collateral than, than what you have with the bond. So I would say there's like a thousand basis points of, of opportunity cost in, in, in that example. So one, I think they give up a lot of return. But two, and just on that example, let's just talk through that example, because you suggested that in some ways, well, I, I guess you are saying it's safer. So Pemex, uh, you know, trades, say, 5%. And what you're saying is a better trade, actually, is to go long suppliers to Pemex and uh, get them to offer collateral. So it's a collateralized uh, uh, lending that you do to them. And then you can get, you know, a thousand base points over. Um, yeah, and so, so exactly, doing a direct loan, you know, a, a bespoke direct loan that, that, that we structure, you pick up Pemex receivable as your correlated collateral, um, but then you get uncorrelated collateral, you know, maybe properties or, or uh, hotels, wh whatever, you know, whatever the family group might have is uncorrelated collateral. Um, and look, we, we don't want that uncorrelated collateral, but we know that the sponsor or the owner of the company does. So I would argue that in that instance, uh, you have higher yield, like you said, a thousand basis points over, uh, but you have less risk because of all this collateral. So of course, there's got to be some give. The give is you give up some liquidity. Now, we're not talking about a 10-year infrastructure bond. We're talking about 9 to 12 months. And again, this gets back to the opportunity cost. Now, the other side of that, however, is remember, people are parking on liquidity because if they want liquidity, they believe it will be there. And the challenge has been, and if you go back to all 11 of those dislocations that I talked about, the average dislocation was like 20 22%. It happens relatively quickly, peak to trough like five months. So the challenge has been that when people go to get their liquidity, um, it's it's there, but it's down 20%. You know? And I guess that gets into the whole ETFs as well, which is I don't think that just because an ETF is, is supposedly liquid that the underlying portfolio is liquid. Um, and so you, you know, you've, you've seen in times of crisis, particularly these ETFs go to liquidate their positions. Well, yeah, it's down quite a bit. So I don't think you can create liquidity where liquidity doesn't exist. And I don't think you should rely upon it, particularly if you're going to be strategically allocated for a long period of time. I mean, a thousand basis points is uh, quite a bit. Yeah. And we have that example all over emerging markets, whether it's Turkey or Mexico or Peru or Brazil, what, what have you. And in order to in order to structure those deals, do you need to have people on the ground? I mean, presumably you have to know the whole legal setup of the country because they're private deals, and uh, and you need to have some confidence in the in the system uh, in order for uh, the contract to be watertight. Yeah, absolutely. So the way that we approach it is we have um, our own direct lending platforms in 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 these countries. They tend to be partnerships with people that have really good skill set, really good pipelines, really good ability to manage the risk locally, but they lack the capital. Um, so it makes for a very complementary uh, relationship. You know, for example, uh, we, we have a, a group in Turkey called Crescent. Um, they do trade finance. I would argue they actually do trade. They have warehouses and they keep the collateral in their warehouse and they'll give a little bit of the underlying um, commodity, if you will, and then get a receivable from offshore. So it's very secure, but it's a lot of work, right? You know, our, our partner in Mexico, MNJ, has close to 75 people doing the supplier finance. Um, so it, it's it's labor intensive, but there's a lot of extra yield to be had. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that that's that's a clear, uh, uh, you know, a clear one where you're you're essentially saying that the sort of the simple liquid trade, uh, there's actually better returns that you can get, and then secondly the the illusion of that liquidity, that it, it's an illusion. You know that liquidity often isn't there at the price you want it in any case. So, so there's a different way of looking at that. Um, so that that makes sense. Um, what what are the misconceptions do you think there are about EM? Well, look, I mean, emerging markets as a label to me is a misconception, right? <laughs> yeah. So, if you go back to the period you talked about before in the '90s, you know, it was much more of a homogeneous asset class, and things kind of went up and down together. Um, today, you know, any given theme for emerging market countries, corporations, quasi can have different outcomes, right? I mean, just take, you know, energy at a hundred and energy at a zero. Well, we have energy exporters and we have energy importers, you know, take any commodity, you know, take foodstuffs, what have you. So, you know, we're, we're starting to see a dispersion of actual outcomes in emerging markets relative to global themes that is perhaps a little bit different than, you know, when people say EM, they go, well, that's bad for EM. Like oil at, at $80 is, you know, is bad, right? It's inflation. Well, 
I don't know, the Mexicans think it's pretty good. Hey, you know, they're exporting. Um, so I, I'd say that's it's become a difficult label or misconception. And you know, China that... and Sri Lanka both got called emerging markets. Is you know tells you there's a, there's, there's a lot in between. <laughs> Absolutely, um, and I often think China. I mean, while it's kind of classified as EM, it's not really EM in many ways. It's the second biggest economy in the world, and in, right. in some ways, it's more important for the global economy than Europe is. Um, but in terms of asset allocation, then, um, you know, people often, the way they look at EM is they'll put a 5% allocation to some EM index, often like MB or MLIN, or, you know, some external debt one or some local market debt one. And it's a very sort of static approach. Now, you have a different um, approach to asset allocation than, than that type of approach. Can you talk a bit more uh, about that? Yeah, and, and I think there's a couple of things to unpack there, which is one, um, an index-based approach to our market to begin with, emerging markets debt. And I think um, indices are, again, people feel safe in an index. But actually, in emerging markets debt, I think indices have been uh, cruel to investors. And what do I mean by that? So when we started in 1999, we looked at the index. And the index had 18% weighting to Argentina. Now, we were already writing analysis internally. Our research was saying that this country is going to default. You know, it looked like the slowest train wreck in history in terms of um, heading towards the wall of default. So why would we want to put 18% of our capital? Now, remember, to not have anything in there is also risky, right? Because you're short 18% of an index. So it forces behavior that isn't necessarily consistent um, with your analysis. So that, that's one challenge. Um, the approach we take, if you give us a blank piece of paper, is to take much more of a, of a multi-asset approach to it. To be dynamic, uh, you know, if a market's going up and down, do you, you know, do you just want to be whipped around all the time, or do you want to think about an asset allocation that could put you in different return streams that have proven to be uncorrelated, and be able to, to take a, take advantage of of the uh, of that volatility? And so the way we think about it is a bit of a, a bit of a barbell. Uh, on on one end, we have high conviction, you know, private debt that I talked about, the example of, of the the Pemex supplier and high conviction investment grade and high yield debt in emerging markets. And that's kind of like a constant source of yield that's always available in the marketplace. That's a pretty good place to anchor because, you know, if you think about it, say you're getting 12% on average for your private debt and 8% for your high conviction uh, uh, public debt, you know, eight plus 12, 20 divided by two, that's 10, right? Like that's a pretty good, pretty good source of current yield that's always there. And then on the other side, take advantage of these, this volatility, this distress that can be idiosyncratic, it can be a Turkey, it can be an Argentina, or it can be systemic, it can be COVID dislocation or, or whatever it may be. And to be able to do, look at opportunistic credit and special situations, which are more like alternative sources of yield or energy. It's not always raining, it's not always windy, so you, can't, you can only tap into it when it's there. I.e., you know, when it's at the peak, you know, and sorry, at the base, you'll you'll peek into it, but when it goes up to the peak, you can turn it off and go somewhere else. So, we have this multi-asset approach to to the market. Um, it relies upon this private credit. That's the special sauce. That's the the, the huge um, differentiator. And the way that we've constructed these these multi-asset partnerships with our clients, it also solves for really another big challenge in asset allocation in emerging markets is most allocators lack the governance and the courage to allocate. So what do I mean by the governance, you know, if, you, if I, if I go to a typical, you know, sovereign wealth fund, pension fund, what have you, um, it's a lot of work to underwrite a manager, to underwrite a return stream. And, and that's why it ends up as a strategic, you know, five-year allocation. Um, but when you go to them and say, Hey, you know, in the future, like we did, you know, Muhammad and I wrote a piece, Muhammad Aaron and I wrote a piece in the, the end of 2019. We think the market's going to dislocate. It's it's overvalued. We're not sure what's going to create it, but but when it does, it will create. It'll be it'll then be the tenth dislocation we've seen, and you should get ready for it and, and attack it. And so I remember calling people in in April and May. We had no idea that COVID would be the the straw that broke the camel's back, but I remember conversations with Yeah, you're right, Robert. You know, totally makes sense. Uh, we can lean in here. Uh, it's April. I think I can get you into our October board meeting. Uh, by then, the whole B-shape recovery has occurred. So uh, one of the reasons that, that we, you know, we've got these multi-asset partnerships is so that we can solve for that governance issue. And also, there's the courage issue. It's like, um, and as you said before, people have had 
um, challenging experiences in emerging markets. And I think it's because they've taken the wrong governance construct and the wrong lack of asset allocation uh, approach or tactical asset allocation. So we, that's how we try and solve with it, with uh, our approach to the top down, if you will. And you mentioned Mohammed Al Aryan, so I should just mention he's the chairman of Gramercy. So there's, uh, hence, you, you mentioned his name. That's right. So Mohammed, uh, you know, he was first an investor with us at Gramercy back in you know the late eighteen nineteen era. Kind of leaned in and said, "Hey, it's really interesting. There's something different going on here." Uh, he became a, a senior advisor first, and and a senior advisor with real meat on the bones. Um, he really helped us think about how do we decode what's going on in the world? How do we have that inform and influence our portfolios? And and maybe from time to time, maybe even impose a view. And, and quite frankly, I never had the confidence as a, I'm not, a, I'm not an economist. And so I never felt like, you know, I have a better understanding than all the other portfolio managers on the platform. So get out of this or go into that. Well, with Mohammed, we, we were able to kind of institutionalize a top-down framework so that we had that confidence, you know, myself as the CIO, but also the PM that, we were, you know, not buying, you know, good homes in bad neighborhoods and that we understood what, what was going on. And, you know, probably the best thing that happened to me during, during COVID was, you know, Mohammed was sitting on the West coast and he's like, Hey, you know, we're all on zoom now. Uh, I think I could have a bigger impact on the business. So, and on the portfolios. And so that's when he became chair. And so we feel, um, very fortunate to, uh, to be with him every day. And, um, uh, it's, you know, great to have, his mind as we vet some of these issues. I mean, I wasn't thinking about what a sudden stop in an economy meant in 2020 and how difficult the startup would be and supply bottlenecks. And, and it's really, uh, really helped him inform and influence our portfolios. No, that's great. No, that's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, you're very fortunate to have someone of his uh, level of experience uh, involved in the company. Now, uh, you've been recently writing about sort of different themes uh, that uh, you're focused on. So, you know, there's some of the usual ones like recession watch, um, inflation, and, and so on. Um, but one that you did mention is about volatility, um, which which struck me. So can you talk a bit more about what you mean by volatility and why, in your eyes, it's a source of opportunity for you? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, volatility was one of the six themes that that we identified um, in our most recent top down or and and at year end, um, and it's it's interesting because in the era of quantitative easing and financial repression, everybody belly ached that expected returns were so low and there was no volatility, nothing to do here. It's like everything's boring, right? And now there's volatility and everybody's belly aching again and. You know, we, we actually, and as we wrote in the piece, it's like, I think volatility is your friend if you, if you embrace it, right? If you anticipate it and you embrace it and you plan the trade and trade the plan as, as we like to say, and, you know, volatility in emerging markets tends to present itself as, you know, these, these big dislocations and, and one has to understand why these dislocations occur because typically, you know, it hasn't been some endogenous risk in emerging markets. It's been some sort of exogenous factor. But what it's really been is a structural change in the, the way liquidity is provided in our market or not provided that creates these, this, this volatility. So what do I mean? When inflows come to emerging markets, there's inelastic supply. So there's always an issuer that's willing to sell a bond at a price, right? Brazil is at four at 14 and everything in between. However, when there's an outflow, there's not inelastic demand. The market gaps. There's there is no buyer of last resort. And you know when I when I traded at Lehman Brothers in say 1997 during the Asian debt crisis, I remember trading the Russian benchmark bond on 27 different price handles continuously with quarter point bid offer spreads. <laughs> Today it just gaps the whole 27 points. Yeah, yeah. And then it, and then it restarts right. And that you know that's the opportunity to embrace the volatility. On both sides, right, and and we also wrote about that at the at, at the end at the end of this quarter and, and the end of last year, which is fourth quarter last year. We said, "Hey, all aboard! Like this volatility, this dislocation is overdone." Well, you know, it ripped in the fourth quarter, and we said, "Hey, you know, time to be cautious here," which means you know, take some take some chips off the table, embrace embrace the volatility, both sides of the volatility. You know, people get giddy when volatility takes them to higher levels. But again, you know, remember what it felt like at those lower levels. And um, what do they say? Um, bulls make money, bears make money, and the pigs get slaughtered. So plan the trade and trade the, pl the, the plan. And that's great. And of course, in you know, we have had some EM-specific issues um, over the past year. The most notable one, I suppose, is Russia 
Russia-Ukraine war. Um, so can you talk a bit about how you approached, well, what your positions were going into, into the invasion and then how you look at things since and its impact on broader EM? Sure. Yeah, a bit to unpack there. So the, the, the first part is, you know, pre the invasion was February uh, 24, 2022. Um, and when Russia invaded Ukraine, Gramercy had zero sovereign risk of Russia and Ukraine. Um, and we feel very fortunate, but also it came from the analysis that, that Petar, our, our analyst, did. And he came to, you know, one of our investment committees in January, early, early January, and he said, I think there's a 40% chance that Russia will invade Ukraine. I think it'll probably be small eye invasion. It'll be, you know, the, the East, Donbass, et cetera. And, uh, you know, and then prices will drop 10 or 20 points. And all we heard was invasion. <laughs> and we're like, if, you know, sounds like a coin toss or sounded like a coin toss for invasion. So for us, it was pretty easy in January to say, you know what, uh, let's look at prices. You know, Russia's trading in at 100 to 150. There's one bond, the Russia 28's traded at 150. Um, where's that bond going to go if it invades? And we're like, could drop 50 points. It actually ended up dropping 50 to 80 points, depending on the bond. So, and then where was Ukraine trading? Ukraine's trading. So, and if we were wrong about invasion, maybe Russia would just stay flat or go up five points. Um, and in uh, Ukraine, the bonds were trading at 80 cents. So like, okay, no invasion, maybe it's 85, but invasion, maybe it's 20. So it was just made no sense to, to, to be involved. As we sit here just, today, just, uh, just, if, yep. if I, just for me to inject, is there, was there a playbook you were looking at? Cause you said 80, 20, you're, 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 you've got numbers in your head. Was that yeah. just from sort of intangible experience or was there some reference point historically that you were thinking this is just like that event? So it's, it's, it's a combination. And, and, you know, one of the things that we're fortunate to have is kind of a distressed DNA and to kind okay. of understand what happens when Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall. And so, so you start that analysis or we started that analysis with default and recovery. And then you overlay ill liquidity on that. So we weren't necessarily saying that Ukraine would default, but typically what happens in these gaps is things go down towards default. And if you look at assets that aren't in default today, they, they price like default in part because of liquidity, Argentina at 30 cents or Ecuador, El Salvador, you name it, Pakistan or what have you, things don't hang out in the fifties anymore. They just kind of go down <laughs> to the twenties, twenties and thirties. So, um, so that was kind of the analysis that, that we did as we, you know, it's funny, it's like in, in emerging markets, you know, either things trade at the yield they're supposed to trade at, or they just start trading at dollar price. There's just nothing in okay. between. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at, at 150 rough 28s were trading at some spread, you know, at 50 cents, it's just 50 cents. It's not about yield or, or, or spread anymore. But then as we think about post invasion, Russia and Ukraine, um, you know, one of the very first investments we did in, in, in Gramercy in 1999 was to buy Russian defaulted debt at six cents. So if you told me that in 2022, that there would be Russian debt trading at 30 cents and that we weren't buying it, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, however, you know, not only did Russia become, you know, in, in our opinion, Russia became uninvestable. First, first legally it became uninvestable, uh, here in the United States. So, um, from an OFAC perspective, from a U.S. Treasury perspective, um, analyzing Russia became a theoretical exercise because you couldn't execute on it anyway, which quite frankly, I think is fortunate because I, I think that it's also an investable fundamentally. Um, you know, we have no clue what post-Putin Russia is going to look like. Um, I actually think it depends on whether Russia is treated like Germany after World War I or Germany after World War II, i.e. is it ostracized or, or embraced. Um, and it reminds me of the, the Yeltsin days, you know, back in the 90s when, when Yeltsin would get sick and go to the hospital. You had to determine which hospital because one hospital was where he went to get sober and the other one was where he went to have cardiac, you know, uh, surgeries and, and what have you. And the reason it mattered because if he had a heart issue and he didn't make it, none of us knew what post-Yeltsin Russia would look like. And I think we're full circle again today, which is we have no idea what post-Putin Russia looks like. So how do you think about investing? I think that becomes uninvestable. Ukraine's a little bit more simple. Um, you know, get back to that, that, that 20 cents and, and recovery value. You know, uh, we stayed out of Ukraine unless it was in the 20s early on. We were opportunistic at, at, at one point. 
And then when we started thinking, you know, unfortunately, this war has gone on and on and on. There's been massive amounts of aid that have come from the G7 and what have you. And one needs to start thinking about the geopolitics of what a debt restructuring might look like, not just the debt sustainability. So, you know, if you look at a typical analysis of an analyst on the street, they'll, they'll do the pure debt sustainability, which is kind of funny because how do you even know what their GDP is going to be when you don't know what their, their territory is going to be? But let's, let's just say they, they can figure that out. And they'll say that, you know, they only need a 20% haircut because, you know, debt sustainability looks okay. Uh, I would argue that there's going to be geopolitics that, the, you know, when the IMF comes in, there'll be uh, debt burden, uh, PSI, uh, private sector involvement. But the G7 is going to start to impose its will. And it's put, you know, tens of billions of dollars. It will put more, you know, uh, you know hundreds of billions of dollars into the reconstruction of Ukraine. And there's going to be a condition precedent, which is, you know, Poland and Bulgaria in 93, 94 were so important to the West that they actually gave a 50% haircut and imposed that on commercial creditors. In Iraq, it was 85% NPD debt reduction after that war. So until Ukraine got closer to like Iraqi levels of 15 cents, to us, it was uninteresting. You know, 16, 17 cents, it starts to, to, to at least warrant consideration. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's very interesting. And um, and in terms of the Ukrainian restructuring, and what's the timeline on this? I mean, nobody knows, right? Yeah. Um, so, and, and the other thing they don't know is what the posture will be of the government in Ukraine on the other side of peace. You know what, and what peace yeah. looks like, right? And, um, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it if it happens relatively swiftly because reaccessing the capital markets um, in a period of reconstruction will be really important. Having a reliable uh, risk-free rate for all the investment and FDI that will come into Ukraine on the other side of the war becomes um, important. But but SWIFT doesn't necessarily mean low haircut. Okay, understood. Yeah, yeah, lots of uh, yeah, lots of scars that you've had from previous uh, periods around that. And, and look, I mean, the, you know, the the role that we've taken in these debt restructurings for twenty five years at Gramercy is to be consensual and constructive. And I think there's something that we'll be able to offer in the Ukrainian thing, which is there's going to have to be some notion of of patient capital, right? Like to to um, partner with Ukraine on the other side, and there's structures to do that. You know, they've done it in the past where you can provide a haircut, you can provide a window for the recovery of Ukraine, but you can also partner with, in, with them in that recovery and exchange a haircut maybe for some sort of GDP recovery warrant. And so, you know, we've, 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 we've got some ideas, we've been doing this for quite some time, and um, hopefully from a peace perspective, it will be sooner rather than later that we have the opportunity to, to sit down. But, um, you know, yeah. many folks didn't think it would last as long as it has. Yeah. And now, if we if we pivot to another part of the world, China, um, in your latest sort of thematics, you mentioned China reopening. Um, aside from the macro, what, what what are for you the credit opportunities within China? Yeah, and you know, and and there's this matrix that there's this theme that keeps winding in your questions, which is there's a lot of things that indices have done to people, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. so, so so I talked about Argentina. I, I forgot to mention that you know I think if you were index long, just market weight. Russia and Ukraine, it cost you about 800 basis points last year. Yeah. Um, China is another great example. There's been big weights to um, China property in the emerging market corporate index. For us looking at China and, and, and we, you know, we think from a broad perspective, China is challenging, uh, particularly when you can't, uh, well, there's issues around property rights and bonds are collection of property rights. So it's really hard to, to, um, affect those, particularly on an, on an offshore basis, but also the the rules of the game seem to change there. So to to make a big macro call and say, "Hey, we like China; it's really cheap," I think is is really challenging. From time to time, you know, we for a very long time we stayed out of China property because it traded at a hundred, you know, traded at par. Um, they were bonds issued by offshore SPVs that had no assets, so asymmetry in your face. But you know that changed last year. You know when when a company like Country Garden started trading at eight cents and it was still performing and still performing to this day. It felt like the fear and the illiquidity had all come together um, to provide a, an opportunity, you know, an opportunistic investment uh, potential in, in, in one little sector of China. And for us, China property, you know, the, the call we had to make in the fourth quarter when we got involved was one that 
that the real the property sector was too big part of the economy to to have happen what many feared that they would just toss the keys and that all these projects would become zombie projects and and what have you it's it's 25 to 35 percent of gdp depending on how you calculate it and it's also an integral part of the value chain within within china itself so we felt that um one you know it's too important to access to capital going forward to foreign capital is going to be important to the sector a bank can't lend to the mortgage you know, to the person buying the house and lend to the company you, you can't have two loans against the same same, same set of of production and collateral and what have you so you know part of our thesis was that they're going to want to reaccess the capital markets well how do you do that you have consensual debt restructurings and that's what we're starting to see, right? Evergrande and Sunak and, and others have started to um, come forward with debt restructuring. And that was the third thing that we had to get right, which is, you know, when we, when we spoke with, um, you know, CFOs and CEOs in China, and remember they were in lockdown. I remember one in particular was in his, in his, in his uh, bathroom with like a, the shower screen. It's kind of like what you have behind you there, the, the, the background. Um, and I realized that, you know, th these people never done a debt restructuring before. They're, they're not really, they're, they're certainly constrained. So you can understand why things are going slower than would have been expected. But none of them were talking about tossing the keys. None of them were talking about insolvency. None of them were talking about liquidation. Yet yet it was trading at liquidation values. And we, sh we saw that in, in Evergrande because now the, the liquidation value has been calculated at like six or seven cents and that's where the bonds were trading. So there seems to be good option value in something other than liquidation, which isn't a base case by any means. Yeah, yeah, understood. Yeah, there's opportunities everywhere, I guess, and uh, and you need to, I suppose, look at what the market's pricing and and the realistic outcome. Um, now, now Latin America is is really interesting this year. We have an election in Argentina. Um, there was an election in Brazil, and we're kind of seeing the repercussions of that. Mexico's interesting as always. So, how how do you look at Latin America at the moment? Yeah, I mean. Uh... Latin America is always about the politics and the politics have been volatile. Um, and, you know, it, the politics always seem to be, you know, the pendulum swings in one direction or, or the other. You know, it wasn't that long ago, there was this clear line between like, you know, the Pacific Alliance and the other countries and, you know, Peru and, and Chile were like the, um, the Switzerland's of Latin America and they were priced as such. And, you know, both have had political disruptions. Well, Peru's had a series of political disruptions, but Chile... Uh, with their new president, their attempt at rewriting the constitution, um, it's created political volatility. Again, volatility is an, is an opportunity if, if you embrace it. Uh, Colombia, you know, uh, with uh, more left-leaning um, government a, as well. You mentioned Mexico, I mean, and, and we just talked about China, right? And one of the things that we learned about the combination of China and COVID was that it wasn't just about just-in-time and lowest price anymore, that manufacturers were going to have to think about about resilience and the ability to deliver goods no matter what happens. Um, and then you take the geopolitics of what's going on with the United States and China, and Mexico is just a big winner, right? And as, as challenged as we thought the AMLO administration would be, you know, you know they've, they've behaved well for the most part as it relates to the expectations of, of the markets, but they become this huge beneficiary of this whole onshoring and what have you. So we think Mexico, even the peso uh, I'm just gonna, is going to benefit from that. And so we, we think it's kind of this is a great example, like one of the winners, right? We think Mexico is going to be one of the winners. Um, and, you know, that's one end of the barbell. The other end of the barbell is maybe something like Argentina, which has its challenges, but it's more than price relative to those challenges. And, you know, there's an election in Argentina this year. You know, we see bonds. I think they paid around 30 cents. I've never been involved in an Argentine debt restructuring. It wasn't worth at least 32 cents. You know, back in 05, which was a ridiculously 66 and two thirds haircut. Uh, so it seems to be overpriced, but we we have a light at the end of the tunnel that's not necessarily a train, and that's an election in October. And you know, we kind of wouldn't be surprised to see a repeat of what happened when it went from Christina Kirchner to Macri, and now when it goes from Alberto Fernandez to someone in the opposition, we think you'll see maybe history won't repeat, but will rhyme and. You know, we would expect these 30 cent securities to be worth, you know, materially more, maybe uh, 45, 50. So, um, you know, there's not a great story there today, like maybe there is in Mexico, but I think there's great potential in, in given where things are priced. Okay. And Brazil, um, you know, Lula came in 
there's been at the macro level, there's been some uh, questions around the f fiscal side versus the central bank. So it's it's been a bit rocky. H how do you see Brazil at the moment? Yeah, it's interesting because um, it, it probably hasn't played out exactly the way I would have expected. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember Brazil 2002, Lula, um, and we were all really, really concerned about this guy, you know, coming from the left. Um, and all of a sudden, um, he surprised to the upside. And so you had all the chaos and all the dislocation before the election or during the election. Um, and, you know, I think the market got comfortable with that, you know, the second coming of Lula is going to be okay. Um, and as you mentioned, there's been, you know, all, all sorts of, of challenges. And so, you know, I, I would have thought that, you know, maybe the market would freak out a little bit about Lula during the election period. And then, and then he would outperform those low expectations. It seems like expectations were too high and now he's underperforming those expectations. And, you know, the, the global economy is very different in 2023 than it was in 2002 when he came in. Yeah. Yeah. And another election that is coming up is, is close to my side of the world in Europe, in Turkey, uh, Turkey's been a, a challenging market in recent years with, um, you know, with FX markets in, in some ways being shut down for external investors. Um, we have elections coming up. What are, what are your thoughts on how how to approach Turkey, at least as a, as an outside investor? Yeah, um, the approach, the outcome, the outlook, the expectation for Turkey has been very volatile, right? Um, I spent a lot of time in in, in Turkey. My, my my wife is Turkish. We're there, you know, probably four, six, eight weeks a year. Um, and Turkey is a place that you know we definitely relied upon private credit and asset backed credit as opposed to public credit. Um, I think Turkey's got a great credit culture, but I think it's got some challenges for credit and the currency, as you mentioned, going forward. Um, you know, the country did the exact opposite of what you would have expected in you know, with hyperinflation to keep lowering rates. Um, so there's definitely some pent up demand for dollars. It's been, you know, very soft capital um, controls, creeping capital controls in the country. Um, so, you know, the, the hard part, you know, when I was there in Turkey last summer, um, it was clear to me that, you know, unfortunately, two sides of the population were really hurting the pensioners and the youth, you know, people in college. And if you had conversations, you know, with those sides, like you're like, there's just no way that Erdogan's going to win. Right. And then the challenge has been that the opposition has been so challenging to itself in terms of being able to coalesce. Um, and then that's created an opportunity for Erdogan to to go up, but then the earthquake hit. So there's just so much so much volatility. Um, it's really hard to call. You know, I mean, one of the challenges that you know, if if you wanted to express a short view in Turkey today, it's virtually impossible. It's hard to borrow securities, hard you know, to borrow equities like 15, 16 percent. So I just wonder. Yeah, you know, it feels like they've got their finger in a lot of different holes, kind of trying to stop the leak. Um, and I guess just four possible outcomes, and I just don't know which one it's going to be. Erdogan wins peacefully. Erdogan wins unpeacefully. You know, it's a challenge. The opposition wins peacefully, and the opposition, you know, loses, you know, peacefully. And um, I, it's just really hard to predict the outcome. But I think, you know, we're trending towards a much weaker currency. Um, you know, I, it seems more likely than not that the opposition is going to win. But you know, we still have a, a month to go, uh, and we'll probably have a second round. Yeah. So I think you guys sit on, on the sidelines here, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah. When I speak to our clients, you know, hedge funds, asset managers, um, you know, people are unsure about uh, who's going to win the election. And plus, people are unsure about what would happen to markets in, in all those four outcomes as well. There's so much yeah. uncertainty about the sequencing of everything. And do you let the currency go initially if the opposition wins just to stabilize things? Or do you hold the currency constant to, as a sign of confidence and let interest rates go? I mean, there's so many uncertainties, so it, it's a challenge. Um, and, and what does Erdogan do if he wins? Because, you know, one, you could say, okay, well, they just did all this just to get victory. Now they're going to be economically more rational. Or maybe they just believe this is the right path, or he does, right? Yeah. Um, I think they're running out of tools in the toolbox to, to keep financial stability. So something's got to change. Yeah. And what country we didn't talk about was India, you know, amongst um, not, not just emerging market, but just global investors, India is viewed as it's almost like a mega trend, you know, that for the long term, India, you want to be long India. Um, its growth rate has been fantastic over the last, you know, five, 10 years. Um, stocks have done very well also. Um, 
I mean, what do you think of the sort of the India story in general, and and also as an outside investor, um, how do you approach? You know, can you sure. access India in the way you want? So, from our perspective, India is much more of an equity story than a credit story. Yeah, um, and part of it is it's very hard. Yeah, you know, it's very hard to access credit. It's hard to move money around for credit. Um, when you think about um, private debt that I mentioned, the, the you know, we, we've analyzed that several times and, you know, there's a pretty deep market in local currency and it's very challenging and volatile for dollar-based investors to go into a market like India um, and not be able to lend in dollars. So for us, there's just, there's a lot of headwind, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's a challenging, remember credit's about understanding what happens when credit goes bad, right? Because that's your, that's your anchor recovery value. Yeah. And quite frankly, that's 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 been a challenge notion in India. If you look at some of the the precedents, you know, uh, SR Steel way back when, you know, um, I mean, one of the best one of the best investments or one of the worst investments we ever did in India is we bought at twenty four and we got out at thirty two. It's just the brain damage it took to to be involved in a debt restructuring there and all the, the federal and local um, regulations that were put up or constraints that were put up against debt restructuring. So it's a challenging credit environment. Um, bankruptcy, you know, bankruptcy environment, which all matters to credit investors a lot more than, than equity investors. We worry about what happens when things go wrong. Equity folks get to worry about what happens when things go right. You know, they're long the call and we're short the put, so, so to speak. So it's challenging from that perspective. And then the other thing I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's, um, you know, we've been oftentimes told that, you know, we should get comfortable with Indian credit because the legal system is based upon the UK. Yeah, and the challenge I have with that is the only thing that we've noticed that's the same is the cost of the lawyer. You know, about, about <laughs> fifteen hundred like quid that. per hour. So um, it's it's not a market we've been very active in. We keep looking at it to make sure that we're not missing something. Um, currency challenges, credit challenges, bankruptcy law challenges. Just you know, um, for the yeah, most part. No, not I, I'm, I'm super, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've heard that from other investors as well. People just you, you, yeah, trade the equity there more than anything else. Um, now, I did want to ask you some uh, some non-markets questions as well. You know, one is, um, what's the best investment advice that you've ever received? The best investment advice I've ever received? Um, I mean, I don't want to sound cheeky, but, you know, kind of buy low and sell high. I think sometimes... <laughs> Keep it simple. I, I, I think people forget that, you know, and, and I've evolved that to plan the trade and trade the plan. But, yeah. you know... Um, anticipate what may happen and when it happens remember that you anticipated it and don't you know you know investing is, is about psychology as much as anything right we, we yeah. can all do financial analysis you know I, i'd say some of the advice that, that i've that i received in emerging markets that has really resonated with us is emerging markets credit is you know it's about people right we're, we're under we have to underwrite credit but we really have to underwrite people and their credit cultures and what happens when things go wrong how they behaved when things go wrong to predict what will happen in the future. And, and that was certainly good, good advice as well. Yeah. And another uh, question I wanted to ask you was, what advice would you give to young people who are about to leave university, uh, perhaps later this year, to enter the job market? What advice would you give them? Well, you know, the, um, the most important, I think, is, you know, there's, since COVID, there's been this whole, um, I guess, movement towards work from home. Right. And nobody wants to go to the office. Um, and I think that's particularly damaging for young you know, students coming out of out of university. So my advice for them would be go to the office, you know, like presence matters, uh, particularly in our business. You know, God invented trading desks be, to be open architectures so you could learn from the people, not even if they're explicitly teaching you, but you're implicitly absorbing. So uh, that absorption doesn't happen. While you know, while you're sitting at home um, on Zoom, so uh, that would be one. And two is to be patient and not jump around so much. You know, I think kids today, you know, it's like, well, I'll try this and I'll try this and I'll try this, which is okay. But you know, try and have some logic to your story, so that when you're interviewing, it makes sense to the person you're in front of them. Like, oh, I, I did auto manufacturing and then I went into finance and then I went into rockets. You know, like try and Try and have a, a story that's evolution, not revolution. No, that's that's really good advice. Um, and then, um, what are there any books that really influenced you? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's been plenty on the investment side, but you know, I'll put my managing partner hat on for for a moment. Um, and also, you know, you know, 
the processes that we have to run around portfolios. And I think uh, one or two books in, in particular for me were more about the management of a business, right? And, and people, and, you know, our industry forgets that, you know, we're all finance geeks and we all just think about, you know, the ZZ column of a spreadsheet, but there's a lot of assumptions about people and the management of an organization that, that go into that spreadsheet, whether you're analy analyzing somebody else that you're going to invest in or, or managing your own uh, company. So one was, um, good to great by Collins. You know, I think it was all yeah. about getting, you know, getting the right people on the bus and getting everyone in the right seats. Um, and the leadership of, you know, the driving of, of that bus. And so that was influential. And another one that's probably a little less known was, um, uh, being strategic by Erica Anderson and has really provided a framework for how to visualize where you want to be and how to create strategies and tactics to get there. And it's been really useful for us as a company, but then we do the same process with our people. So we have a strategic plan for the company, but then Gramercy Career Management is about a strategic plan around each one of our employees. And it's really simple. It starts, they always start with a challenge question. 08, it was, how do we go from being a hedge fund to an investment management firm? For our employees, it's, how do I simultaneously contribute to the vision of the company, but move my career in the desired direction? And so Erica's book provided a lot of framework for, for, for those processes. Yeah, that's great. Uh, those are excellent uh, answers to those questions and, and uh, excellent conversation earlier as well. Uh, how, how can people uh, follow you? I mean, we, uh, you know, I guess on, on LinkedIn, the firm, you know, myself and the firm, we have, we have a presence there. Uh, we're pretty active with our website. We put out quite a bit of, you know, we try and we pride ourselves in there's a lot of content at Gramercy that we need to, for, for our analysis, but we like to share that with our, with our clients. And so that's done on, um, on our website, whether it's the emerging market insights or videos, or what have you. So between social media and the website, it's a pretty good, pretty good start. That's great. I'll add, I'll add the links to, to the show notes as well. So with that, uh, thanks a lot, Robert. That was excellent. I learned a lot and good luck in, uh, for this year, in this volatile year. Great. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure with you today. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.